for me, the biggest challenge and most fun always is to take super complex, hard to understand topics and make them understandable. And that really is important for everything that I do. So this project, this ProX project, to me still was the most fun project I've ever done in my entire life because it was the hardest nut to crack. It was such a hard nut to crack and the challenge couldn't be bigger than to change the operational system of an entire globally operating company. It can't be any harder. Welcome to the New Process Podcast. Learn all the tools, methods, and best practices combined with people, e emotions, and a, and a human-centric mindset to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Uh, level. And, here, and, here, and here is your host, Marco Kloppenberg. Yeah, welcome to episode 11 of New Process Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Ole Tillmann about how to pitch your process. Ole is strategic brand and communication consultant, executive coach and founder of Peak Creative Leadership. He's based in Berlin and he's also working as startup coach and consultant for accelerators like APX, the startup accelerator of Axel Springer and Porsche. He is author of the book Beyond the Obvious and for sure we are also going to talk about that as well. And um, yeah, maybe you also know Ole as an actor or a moderator. And uh, by the way, beginning of the 2000s, he was host of the music TV show Top of the Pops. I met Ole when he was working as a consultant for Lufthansa Technik. And we've been working on several projects together, which has been always very inspiring for me. And I learned so much from Ole that I thought it might be great to have him at the New Process podcast as well. Just to give you an outlook of what is coming up, besides a lot of insights on Ole's work, you will learn about the secret ingredients of a perfect pitch and how to create one. You will learn how to pitch your process to top management as well as how to inspire employees for processes. Yeah, there is a big case we are providing with a lot of insights into. And finally, you can also learn how to learn more about how to create a perfect presentation, which is quite useful at several occasions, I would say, within business. So enjoy the episode with Ole Tillmann. And now, let's start to rethink processes. Yeah. Ole, welcome to the New Process Podcast. It's great to have you here. As I already said, we did some really exciting projects together and I learned so much from you. So I'm happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mirko. Happy to be here. Yeah, great. So let's dive right into it and uh, start with a check-in. And the first question I always ask my guests here is, what do you prefer in an aircraft, aisle or window seat? Aisle seat, usually because it's easier for me to get in and to get out. And also, I'm very happy to have my hands very early at the luggage. Um, so that's why I usually want to sit aisle. That's very good. And is there a favorite airport that you have? Actually, yeah, I, I, I mean, I like Frankfurt a lot. I like, really? Yeah, I like Munich a lot. Um, these are, these are, yeah, I mean... We are spoiled with airports, I think, right? And we are spoiled that we are allowed to just take the plane with our German passport and then fly to wherever we want to. This is why I usually don't have too many expectations to airports. Um, it's really, it's important for me to get to the lounge, the business lounge, if possible, um, spend some time there, get to the plane and get off, right? So that, that's usually what I like. Um, I mean, I've been to Tokyo, uh, which has been amazing. I've been to, to Moscow, to Istanbul, we've been to China. There are so many international airports that um, are quite also intimidating uh, just by its sheer size. But uh, I wouldn't say I have one favorite one. I don't know. No. Okay, no problem. <laughs> So uh, then let's get closer to the topic of process here. Um, looking back, uh, what was the best process you have ever experienced? Actually, I think Americans are, are really process heroes, especially in the entertainment world. And I remember uh, being at Universal Studios at a theme park a couple of years ago. 
and uh, I've been at the Minion Ride. So, you know, the, the tiny, the, the yellow uh, comic characters. And the idea of the Minion Ride is that you, together with 50 other people, stage by stage are transformed into a Minion. So you stand in front of the building, and you step into the first room, the, the door closes behind you, and you stand there, and then the, the floor starts shaking, or a crazy scientist, an actor as a crazy scientist come out, comes out, and some fog, and then they talk to you, and they help you to transform step by step. At the end, you get out, and uh, you are a minion. And I thought this process design was so amazing thought story because it allows you to experience entertainment at scale. And so all the actors who've been there, I mean, they, they sometimes only had a couple of lines, but they must produce them and reproduce them over and over and over again. And still, it needs to look fresh, right? Um, still, it needs to appear to the audience as if they have said their sentence for the first time. And this, to me, um, was very well, very well designed processes they had at, at hand there. Okay, yeah, that's uh, super cool. Thanks for these insights. And um, how how would you describe your personal relationship to processes? So how did you get to know processes? Yeah, I think I discovered my love for processes um, you know, early on as an actor. Because as an actor, if you stand in front of a camera, especially in uh, television, You have to sometimes over and over sh shoot the same scene again. Um, sometimes from different angles, sometimes you have a mistake, then you have to redo it. And uh, you get very used to going over and over through processes. So that was the first time I really got aware of that. And then when I made my acting and acting coaching education, I've been trained in an American storytelling system for actors, which is a step-by-step -step process for an actor to build up their relationship with the role they want to play and then really immerse and then at the end become the role. And uh, this, this uh, process really hit home to me. Ah, I thought, this is, this is so professional if you do it like this. And even creativity, I mean, acting is all about creativity and processes do not exclude each other. At the end, they're complementary, right? So, um, and this is where I fell in love with processes. And then I um, understood also with my topic of presentation design, communication of innovative ideas, I need to build a repeatable system. And a repeatable system, a method, a methodology with um, um, a repeatable outcome, right? Quality outcome is only possible if you have a good process design. So, and this was uh, very clear to me. I need to build something like that. That's also why I've written my book, uh, Agile Presentation Design, a step-by-step -step guide to more impactful presentations, right? It's a method. I developed that method. And I know when we, the both of us, when we started to work together at uh, Lufthansa Technik, um, it was very interesting because um, you've invited me to work with all your colleagues um, to develop their pitching skills of innovative ideas. And I came with a process and it was super smooth. So the integration was super smooth. And I never knew why that was until we started to work on the process uh, of ProX. And then I said, ah, because Lufthansa Technik is all about processes. Now I come as an external consultant with another process. And it integrates so smoothly because everyone speaks the language of processes. And uh, th this is where I really first understood The, the real importance of neat processes, where I really understood, wow, in the business world, if you don't have your processes together, you cannot produce reliable outcomes. Okay, yeah, that's super cool. So now you are working as a strategic brand and a communication consultant. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that, what you are doing there? Sure. So one example would be a newly established brand, let's say a venture capital firm. So I, I work a lot in the, in the startup ecosystem. So these are my natural clients. A venture capital firm approaches me and says, hey, we're newly newly um, set up fund. 
uh, we are looking for a branding. Could you help us with this? And um, so what I do is an extensive research phase. I try to understand the brand. I try to understand the target group, competition, and all these kind of things. And then from there, I develop a narrative. Uh, and this narrative then is displayed in, uh, in the brand itself, in the logo, in the website, and all the other communication materials. So this is one part. And I I, I love to work on this because uh, I, I'm super curious and I love to tell stories and I love to do it with design. Then um, another uh, use case I would have is that VCs again or startups approach me to work with the startups uh, on their equity story in a preparation for their funding um, uh, in, or an investor's communication. So this is what I do on a regular basis. I do this for uh, APX, which is the accelerator program of Axel Springer and Porsche. Do it since more than eight years for them, also for the previous program. And um, yeah, then I also, I, I prepare um, CEOs uh, from younger companies, scale-ups for the internal, but also external communication, internal that would be, I support them with their all hands uh, meetings and uh, how would they communicate effectively throughout the entire organization. Um, I'm a sparing partner here. I, I really help them to develop uh, their concepts and then also support them how they get them um, communicated through the entire organization, but also with the external communication, meaning for product keynotes and so on. And then I work as a creative consultant or creative producer supporting um, working on the entire script on the visuals and then also as a director uh, when it comes to insinating everything on stage um, and uh, this is what I do against the backdrop of my own career as an actor and as a moderator in television yeah that's super cool I, and I guess you have developed hundreds of pitch presentations Uh, when consulting startups and um, other corporates there. C can you tell us, wh what are the secret ingredients of a perfect pitch? Yeah, I think the first thing that everyone needs to have at hand is a very graspable product vision at the beginning. And this is what most startups fail doing correctly. They start to talk about what they do They talk about their impact, but they not really talk about the product. And as an investor, you must understand right from the first sentence onwards what the product or what the startup is all about, right? So product vision at the beginning is very important and you need to um, and, and you need to explain the big picture. Uh, why is it important? Why now? Who is your protagonist? So who, who is your user? What's the user experience? Um, and um, then visualize everything that you do, right? So that's, that's also very important. The most successful fundraisers I saw, they visualized everything they did with uh, computer-generated images, right? If you look at, for example, the startup Lilium, it's for me a, it's for me a best practice, um, they were able to raise a lot of money um, even before they had their first flying prototype because um, they were able to show their product vision, like let's say the, the Lilium jet in front of the Copacabana or New York. Um, and we understood, oh, okay, this is how it looks like or the heliport or whatever uh, was necessary to understand what they do. So having the product vision is very, very important. Um, and that's to me always the first part. And then the rest, all the business metrics They can only be understood once I've understood uh, the value that the product creates. And I need to understand the customer and the, also the, 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 the insights that the startup had, why they came to their solution and uh, the inciting incident where the founder understood, ah, this is a problem and I need to solve it and I can't solve it because of my background, because I have a very special industry insight. And if you weave all these modules together, into a compelling narrative at the beginning, then you not only grasp the audience's attention, but you also hold it and you make it a meaningful experience for them to listen. So what I usually say is you need to, you need to, have, a, you need to have such a structured, clear narrative that the audience is not forced to think, mm -hmm. but only to experience the meaning of your narrative. Okay, so how do I get there? How does the process look like of uh, creating that? Yeah, the creative process usually always follows the same patterns. And that's also very interesting once you've understood that. Um, at the beginning, every creative process is super messy. And you need to allow yourself 
to step into that, what is called the divergent phase of the creative process. So you open up, you generate as many ideas as possible, crazy ideas, ideas maybe that would never find themselves in the final product, but you would allow yourself at the beginning to just explore and to stay open and generate and generate and generate. And then <clears throat> only once you have reached a good height um, or depth in your creative process, then you start boiling it down in the so-called convergent phase and you start to exclude ideas, you start to um, prioritize and you create a first rapid prototype. And um, then if you have that rapid prototype, and I usually use post-it notes, for example, or just um, some sketches in the whiteboard, um, if, you have, if you have this prototype at hand, and it's very important to start every creative process opening up and then closing it down so that you also have a feeling of accomplishment. And then you have that first prototype at hand and then you let go. And that's very counterintuitive, but it's very important. So you, let's say, create a first uh, storyboard. You have it on the whiteboard uh, and then you let go. You do something entirely different. Uh, next task, you go for a walk or whatever it is. And then what your mind does subconsciously is it consolidates all your thinking. And then you might get inspired by other things uh, that you see or discussions that you have with others. And then because you have that storyboard, you have a container in which you can put all the inspiration that you have alongside. Um, later, you're at the storyboard again, or if you have a digital copy of it, you can just integrate it there. And um, then you might have experienced it yourself, Noko, um, if you have written a text and you sleep a good night, and then next day you look at the text again, you see all the things that you would like to change, right? Also processing information whilst you're sleeping is very important. It's a very important part of the process. And then um, you look at all the stuff with a fresh eye and then you start rearranging and shaping and so on and so forth. But again, you open up from here. So you go into another divergent phase and then you go back into convergent phase and then you get even closer and closer to the gist um, of your of your idea until you then can release your product. So I think um, pitch design or communication design is very much like product design. And um, if you understand that you need to have breaks in between, you understand that you need to start very early, let's say a couple of weeks or sometimes a month before an important presentation. And then to me, every thing that you do is a presentation, everything in business life, right? Whenever you want to communicate something with uh, something with someone, then uh, you need to have a presentation for that. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's a marketing strategy, it's a, if it's a pitch, if it's um, just um, yeah some instructions or whatever it is. So yeah, this is the the process. So you come from very messy at the beginning to very clear and structured at the end, and the idea is to come from chaos to order, and you tight against reality to get your thinking into that that clear and concise storyline. That's cool. I actually I wasn't aware that sleeping could be part of a professional process design. And that's super cool. I know that taking a shower uh, me personally often helps to sort out uh, what's in my mind and uh, come up with cool ideas uh, but sleeping that's that's cool. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Yeah, you so. you should try to get as many sleep circles in between the first draft of your thinking and the final result. That's really very important. Okay, cool. That reminds me of a call I had yesterday with a, a customer of mine where we thought about setting up a workshop to yeah, inspire top management for processes. And um, in the end, I said, yeah, okay, I think I need a night to think about what uh, to do there. And And now, as you are here, what would be your recommendation uh, for us to approach the top management? Uh, how to proceed in pitching process management to top management? <laughs> so, okay. First of all, we have to understand if someone is a top executive, top management, usually they like decision making, right? Usually they, they, they are very action oriented. And as with every good story, you need to always communicate receiver-oriented, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about your story that you share, even if that's counterintuitive, but it's more about the reflections and connotations your audience has 
with regards to what you're saying. So you try to own that process in your audience's mind. And if you know that there is a person who is um, who's very action-oriented, likes decision-making, usually this is the countersign to processes, right? Because processes are very detailed. Um, they are very much focusing on the process and not only on the outcome. So, but for decision making, outcomes and options are very important. So, what I would recommend to do is um, design the story from the perspective of the listener, think of their frameworks and mindset, and try to narrow down everything that you have to say to a very action oriented, option oriented uh, version of your content. Therefore, it must be concise, it should be visual. Right, because that usually helps with uh, processing information if you visualize the, the information, and it should be very much accurate but simplified, and that's very very important. They usually only have little time um, in top management; they have to prioritize, and if they don't get the value of it right away, then you're already off. So that's what you should think of: what's in it for them? How can they benefit? with your idea. How can they save money, do something quicker, um, with more ease? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, focus on that. Okay, yeah, that helps. And maybe we can talk about that in a few weeks to see how this worked out. <laughs> That's uh, super interesting. But let's uh, switch perspectives there and uh, not talking about top management. Let's pick up employees. So as uh, I learned, uh, the biggest challenge of all the people providing process management to an organization out there is that processes are often perceived as something really boring, not very exciting. What are your ideas? What would you recommend on how to proceed to inspire people? So employees working in processes for a specific business process or process in general? Yeah, maybe we can use our example for that, Mirko, of our joint um, collaboration we had a couple of years ago with ProX at, um, at uh, Lufthansa Technik or Deutsche Lufthansa in general. Um, yeah. Maybe you could provide us with a bit of background around the project and why you decided to then ask me to jump in and support Yeah, that's super interesting. As I, I remember, we just, um, I, I knew you already from another project where we pitched something to our board and that was super exciting. And I thought maybe we could ask Ole to get some ideas on how to communicate what we are going to do here. And uh, we invited you to Hamburg and we explained you the situation, which was basically like uh, we were setting up a new process excellence process for the whole Lufthansa group uh, so the design was already there and uh, we had some ideas some pictures how this process looked like uh, for sure we also mapped the process very detailed and uh, now the question was how can we roll it out how do we tell it to the people and I still remember us standing there in that meeting room and um, putting sticky notes onto the wall and we ended up with something really big I would say um, which was then called the uh, pizza game and uh, that, that was how it all started uh, just from my perspective so what about you Ole? what do you remember Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I understood that the challenge was that you came up with this new process management system, ProX, and you were asked that all 140,000 employees at that time should work with that new system. And then we yeah. thought of, okay, how can we communicate the value of that new system to 140,000 people? And for sure, um, in um, uh, an email Or in the in or just um, a message in the uh, intranet wouldn't work. Also, just to put some flyers at the cafeteria wouldn't work, right? Because uh, the, the 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 we were about to change the entire operational system of an, a globally operating company, right? It, it couldn't be more complicated to me now that that I yeah. think about it. Yeah. And you came, you, you had this great idea in mind, which had a lot of value. And we understood it because we took ourselves the, the time to really go through it. But um, you, you already had one approach where you tried to um, communicate um, your, the, the value of the new system to 400 archi architects or process architects, uh, pro process yeah, professionals process architects, right. within the company, right? 
And it was very hard to convince them. And so you approached me and you said, we have a second chance. We have a second trout. We have two days with them. So how can we make them see the value in it? And I remember that my first thought was, how can we, how can we make the value experienceable for them, right? So how can they see the value of it right away in that moment? And usually also in learning theory, if we only see th something, let's say a process flowchart on the wall and someone talks about it, it's very hard to understand the real meaning of it. And so we co-developed that idea that we need to um, we need to let the people in the room, like 400 people in fr Frankfurt in the convention center, we need to let them experience the real value of the process. And I, I remember that we thought we need to some somewhat build, build up ambassadors for this value. So we decided to build this uh, board game, which I, I think at the beginning was uh, building paper planes um, and uh, then going through yeah. your entire process that you have developed through the process. And then at the end, we ended up with uh, the, the, the pizza game, which uh, came more, more handy. And we developed an entire game, right, with a story around it. And um, then we developed uh, the, the, the board game even further. To, and we played through it a couple of times until we understood, yes, it works. And it works with all the KPIs, which are also relevant uh, for a globally operating um, um, uh, flight company, right? So um, once we had that and we had the story and we designed everything with nice graphics, we then, uh, we've then been to Frankfurt, to the convention center. We knew we had uh, 400 people. We designed, um, we designed uh, the entire two days in ways so that in smaller groups, these people could experience the value. And what did we do? We said, okay, they are all now in a, in a fictional scenario uh, working um, in, a, in a pizzeria. And now they must use the ProX process to produce the most reliable, highest quality, fastest results uh, in that pizzeria. And then I understood we, we had like 18 different groups, like 400 people in 18 groups. And we explained them the entire game and we had this fictional character, Nonna, and she was in Italy and had this wonderful recipe yeah. for the pizza. And uh, now um, we, we, we then created this scenario where uh, she bu built up the company in the 60s and then because of the great quality, uh, they were having more and more franchise companies within Italy, um, but um, they had different quality levels uh, within their uh, nodes. And then competition from uh, the outside entered the Italian market. So competition was fierce and they needed to level up. They needed to come back to the best possible outcome, the best possible results. So they needed to follow the one-on-one -on -one recipe from Nonna, right? So that was more or less the idea. And then we said, okay, we have 17 or 18 different pizzerias now here competing for the best process. And we then after we created this fictional scenario, and I think, they must have been really thinking that was so strange. I remember standing on stage and they were looking at all the characters and all the roles and so on. But um, they started uh, then working into it. They went into their workshop rooms. They produced the first pizzas. And um, of our team, everyone was measuring the result. And I thought that was really amazing. So we had all the real KPIs at hand. What did we do? We then put everything into the presentation. We got them back into the big convention room, 400 people, and we put the results onto the screen. And we saw difference in quality and output, right? So one were super good, some others were really bad, and it was great, great variation. And so we said, okay, now you have gone through it for the first time. Now, please go all back. Do what you're best at. Design processes to improve uh, the outcome. So they all went back um, to their workshop rooms. They worked on their process design. They again came back to the convention room. And now we saw that some got even better. Some improved a little bit, but everyone was slightly better, but not really to that point that we would have the same quality everywhere. So then I really liked that idea. Uh, you, Mirko, and your team, you were harvesting the best practices from all the teams, right? Who has done what in the process design uh, to really make the process better? And I, I still remember the, the night session that we had 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was really funny. Maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah. So in in the uh, I would say at night we we brought together a representative of each and every pizza place, uh, the process managers, so fighting for their local um, process and bringing in the ideas they developed in their workshops, and and we tried to standardize that so to create a best practice process, which was really a night shift. I would say, <laughs> unfortunately, we missed the party. And um, next morning we introduced the new process including uh, some pretty cool tools uh, they developed to the whole audience there and they all went back to their local pizza places and produced pizza based on this best practice process yeah and then the result was amazing yeah. when they came back to this room 400 people from all over the world who were there in frankfurt who played a fictional pizza game and who really took it very seriously at that point right that was also funny at yeah. the beginning they were like eh, what do they want from us but then they really they bought into it and they come into that room and we put on the results and they were outstanding everyone was producing the best possible results And that moment, I still get goosebumps now that we talk about it. Um, and they, they were, they understood the value of it. They said, whoa, that's amazing. We have to exactly do it like this. And then we said, yes, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an onboarding process in Adelaide or Amsterdam. Um, you need to have one process owner and uh, you don't have to redevelop everything. If you once have the perfect process for the onboarding of a specific uh, airplane type, you, be you better stick to it. And um, then you can reproduce it all over the world. So, and that's, I, I think this is where it hit home for the people. And that's what I meant with let them experience the value. Because from that moment onward, they became our ambassadors. And I know that we have developed the cardboard in a way that we can easily reproduce it. And then every, every team lead could take that back home to wherever they came from, from all over the world. And they could replay that together with their team. They could educate them how to do it. They could then again play it with their teams. And this is how it dripples down to the entire organization. And I understood and remembered that this was really very important. So making processes and their value experienceable, I mean, really physically experienceable is the key so that people can start working on their behalf. If they get only a technical chart, it's very hard for them to experience it. Yeah. Yeah, so true. And I still remember that a year after uh, we had these events, people approached us and asked, can we have the game? We want to play it with our team. It's not that much fun to do it in a smaller group, but they could still experience how the process really worked out in the end. And uh, that was great. So, yeah, wow, that was a good time. <laughs> so now that we think about it, you know, uh, Mirko, Because you asked me up front, what, I, what do I do? And I said, uh, yes, uh, brand design, and um, I support startups with investors, communication. I support CEOs uh, with their keynote design and so on and so forth. This is what I really like. But what, for me, the biggest challenge and most fun always is to take super complex, hard to understand topics and make them understandable. And that really is important for everything that I do. So this project, this ProX project, to me still was the most fun project I've ever done in my entire life because it was the hardest nut to crack. It was such a hard nut to crack and the challenge couldn't be bigger than to change the operational system of an entire globally operating company. It's, it's, it can't be any harder. And um, this, is what I, this is what I like most. Unfortunately, Not a lot of companies even understand that uh, they need to work on their process design and that this could be something that would help them to really leverage more their potential. Yeah, definitely. And for me, it was also an amazing experience. And I, I still remember what we did there and uh, how we did it. And I would love to bring this spirit to other companies as well. So if there are people out there listening to what we just talked about and they are interested in that, uh, maybe we, we can even think about how to push it even further uh, to create something new like that again. So that's that's cool. Yeah. Well, no, no, for sure, for sure. And I think, as you said, it's we, we brought it to a very good point, I think. And we, braid, we brought it to a repeat 
or to a point of repeatability, right? So, yeah. and, and, that, and that's to me where you need to bring it in. It needs to be so well designed that you can repeat it over and over again with the desired outcome, right? That's to me, the, 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 there it needs to be. And only if you yeah. have achieved that point, you know that the process is there. But still, I, I thought that, yeah, of course, what we have done, we brought it to a very great level. Um, we could push it even further. For sure, we could push it further. Um, but uh, to make it even more experienceable and using digital layers and so on and so forth, we didn't have the time to do that and not the mandate, but uh, for sure, there is still room to push it further. Yeah. Wow, that, that's super cool. Thanks, Ole, for all these insights. Also from your perspective on how, how we did that at that time. So that's super interesting. And I still remember us standing on stage and uh, introducing uh, the game to the people. That was awesome. Cool. Yeah, and also one, one more thing maybe, uh, what, what was important. Yeah. I thought we had these kind of gamification elements within. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always pushed it one step further um, so that the people, so we pushed the people through this gaming process so that they experienced it, understood better. Ah, that's it, that's it, that's it. And then whenever they have reached a certain point in their understanding, we brought them the theoretical input, right? So about roles the necessity of roles in that uh, process design um, or um, other things around the KPIs. But whenever they have reached that specific level, we brought them the theoretical input. And this again helped them to connect their emotional experience with this patterns, with these patterns, that these theoretical patterns. And then the combination of both is what is so powerful, right? If it's only emotional, it's not repeatable. If it's only theoretical, it's not experienceable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even a dry topic like processes can be super exciting for people. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we need to convince them that this is a thing. And I didn't know I was such a nerd around processes before really I met you at Lufthansa Technik, knowing that you were even worse. Uh, that, but, yeah, but, 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 but what I like is, so if you, if, if, you, if you understand that everything is a creative process, right? And um, cr creativity and human experience can only be scaled if you use the right processes, just as I described at the beginning with the process of the Minion Ride, the theme park, mm -hmm. uh, Universal Studios. Yeah, right? So it's an emotional human experience. It's entertainment, of course, but it's an experience that, that you go through. And because of the process, it's scalable. And uh, th this is what I like. I mean, if you look at other, so it's, it, it's very American, I think. It's very, very American. If you look at all the franchise fast food companies like McDonald's, uh, other companies, it's always about that process, right? They know exactly uh, what degree the fat has to have uh, for uh, the, the, the thickness of the burger patty, how long you have to put it into the fat in order to produce it as efficiently as possible. I think they are, They are really good in that. Um, but um, Lufthansa Technik is even better because it's high risk environment, right? So you must be really able to detach an entire, let's say, Boeing 737 uh, over, haul it, and then um, reattach it in the right way, not forgetting one screw. And it needs to fly again with hundreds and thousands of people in the most dangerous uh, circumstances. And this to me is the grand mastery of process design and process capability. So summing that up, uh, what are your top recommendations to uh, our listeners on how to yeah, rethink processes? Or what is your key message there? <laughs> yeah, so as I said, everything is a creative process. No matter you are designing your garden, you are overhauling an airplane, you are working on the financials of your company. To me, everything is a creative process. And creative processes also follow specific steps. As I said, from chaos to order, it's always the same. And you follow an emotional journey with all of that, right? Chaos usually puts us in a, in a, in a, in a place of fear. Because we think, oh, maybe this time we do not know what to do. Or um, you might start thinking about 
your own capabilities. Am I good enough? And so on. These are all the things that usually happen at the beginning of a creative process. But if you push through these emotions and you understand that your insecurities are only an indicator for your own carefulness of how good something needs to be designed and that you understand you, you need to push it further until you feel secure. And you, you, you want to get beyond that point of fear to feel that security and even maybe boredom at the end once you have that perfect process at place. So the emotional journey is always the same. Push through it until, until you feel the security and take your own fear as an indicator that the process is not designed well enough. And maybe a good book recommendation also, which uh, I really like about creativity and, um, and uh, processes, is from Canadian management professor Roger Martin, The Design of Business. It's a really, really great book. It talks especially about uh, the creative process uh, and uh, how a design mindset can help you to create great user experiences through process design. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you also for this recommendation. Um, that's super interesting. So where can our learners, uh, our listeners <laughs> go to if they would like to learn more about what you are doing? So, um, of course, my homepage, tillman.com, then peakberlin.com, And then, I mean, I give classes, I teach people what I do, support them with their concept design. Um, so this is uh, one thing, so they can directly approach me. And if there is interest in my topic, you can buy my book, Agile Presentation Design, An Innovator's Guide to More Impactful Presentations, and you can find that on Amazon. And uh, I mean, this is a this is just a process, Mirko, and it describes everything that we were talking about. And I think so. My my approach with that book was to contribute something to the global design community. So this is also why I put so much effort into the design, uh, not only the process design but also the visual design. And I think that the real impact this book can have in helping people to structure their thinking and being able to communicate their innovative ideas with more impact. The real impact has not even um, uh, developed yet. So I think it still has a lot, a lot potential um, to support people approaching knowledge design or presentation design in a fundamentally different way. Yeah, I fully agree. And I ordered your book on the day you um, communicated that it's coming out. And it's still here, lying next to my desk. And I look into it from time to time to get some inspirations. And there is no other book. It's just your book lying here at my table because I, I really hate reading books. But this is a, a format which, which I love to read. So I can definitely support your recommendation there to... Have a look at. Uh... Uh, let me let me share one last thought, maybe about creativity ah. and processes. Right. So when I've designed this book, I thought I want to ha write a book which has the the knowledge depth of a real book. Right. So if you read a management book, whatever, um, whatever topic, but usually they they are really deep in information and you have to digest it and go back to it over and over again. So I said, I want to have this kind of depth. But on the other hand, I want to have the readability of a magazine. So I worked with two metaphors, right? So book and magazine. Later on, I merged it as a working title into Macbook, so magazine book. So then I tried to understand how a book works, right? So of course, it's the structure. If you look into the content uh, overview at the beginning, it's a structure. Okay, I thought, okay, I need to have a very clear structure. It's very important. But, the, but then I looked at magazines and I thought, why do they work so well? Why, when, why, am, why, why do I like the, the lightness they provide? And then I wanted to understand how magazines work. And I sent my former employee, Kilian, to the Berliner Hauptbahnhof, to the railway station, um, to, the, to, to the newspaper store. And I asked him, buy only the most beautiful magazines that you can find so he brought them back five or six of them and then we cut them 
And then we brought them to the wall, right, to get an overview of the thing. And then we understood uh, the ingredients when I said, oh, a magazine is all about images. I understood, oh, I need to have good images. So I hired a photographer for every workshop, for everything that we did, for all the content. So throughout the entire book, you have the same image style um, and everything is very visual. Then I understood you need to have um, great um, illustrations. So we hired the best illustrator. But what I saw in the most magazines was that there was different styles of illustrations throughout the entire magazine because the different, um, different editors maybe contributed with different illustrators they hired. But I said, I want to have a consistent feeling with the same illustration style. So we hired um, with Christopher De Lorenzo, one of the world's famous um, uh, illustrators. So he worked for New York Times, for Times Magazine and so on. So really top notch. And again, my approach was I want to contribute something to the international design community. So, um, so at the end, we brought these two concepts of the book and the magazine together. And this is how then the readability and the depth um, then came together. But again, it's a process, right? And metaphors, you can work with metaphors in order to inform your process and your decision making alongside that, that process. Uh, so th this is this is actually now that we talk about it, the, the 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 combination of creativity and process thinking is what really really drives me. Yeah, and I, I'm really surprised that you, I, for me it was just a pretty cool book. Yeah, with cool methods in it, which can I look into from time to time to get some ideas and uh, guidance on how to do it. Yeah, but uh, I, I would say you completely reinvented um, the process of writing a book with what you just explained that's uh, just uh, super exciting to to hear what you did there and that shows what you are all doing um, even when you're just writing a book yeah but i did not only write the book um i also designed the entire book together with um axel lauer my co-designer and uh, we did that together um axel did a lot of great work for the wired magazine before and we became a team uh the cre creative design team in that whole thing and um we also um published a book Right, so I didn't work with a with a with a publisher, but I said I want to have the entire creative freedom. I want to do it myself. So I found out how to publish it, to how to get an ESPN number, um, how to get it on Amazon, how to get it listed, um, and so on. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, I, I I I try to understand everything in in the entire process, and now it's there, and and I, I really love it. It works on my behalf, and. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you like it. And funny enough, I have a lot of people who told me, Ole, I still have it on my desk. And now when I think back at the product vision I had, I thought, so I was, I was in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. And you see, I'm very um, Americanophile or Anglophile. Um, we've been to, to Abbott Kinney, which is like the coolest street in Los Angeles, right? All the cool coffee shops there and uh, jeans stores and so on. And uh, also concept stores. And a concept store... Um, the features of a concept store is you can not only buy clothes, for example, but also nice candles or card games or just beautiful items. And I thought if whenever I write a book, I want it to be so pretty that it lies in such a concept store. And then if people see it, even if they don't understand the topic, they just buy it and they have it at home, putting it somewhere so that it provides happiness with the design. It, this is exactly what was happening, right? So people now have it and they just don't yeah. want to give it away. I, to me, it's also the same. Every time I look at it and I think Axel really did a great job here, I, I think, oh, it's so pretty. It's so pretty still. And, and it, I think in 20 years or 30 years, it still will look pretty because it's timeless. Yeah, definitely. And you you just have to buy that book because looking at the cover, I, and now you're here and we're talking about that. I have to ask a question because there is this hole on, on the cover, a circle uh, where you can see the green behind and it's shining somehow. What's the idea behind that? So it's about getting your ideas to the point, right? And you see that it has this uh, this kind of halo, right? And it seems like The idea is not really clear at that moment. If you then take the cover and take it off, you will see yeah. a solid circle. So this is the entire creative process of something which is not clear at the beginning and bringing it really to the solid point. So from vague to solid. And that's the idea of the cover. Super cool. <laughs> It's a process again, right? Yeah, definitely. Wow. Ah, Ole, I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything we've missed? I, I guess a lot, but uh, with regards to 
new process or rethinking processes? No, just one thing I would like to say to you. I re I'm really grateful that you gave me the opportunity um, with, uh, first of all, talking to you now today, but also earlier uh, uh, in, in the, in the pro -X process to bring me into that and then to um, co-design it together with you, uh, bringing in everything that you had and everything that I had to, uh, together with our teams and then um, collaboratively design this, uh, this entire project. I really enjoyed that. And uh, it really brought my understanding of what I am capable of delivering into the the business world. Um, uh, it really changed my it really changed my self perception. Um, and uh, to me, everything is like a like a puzzle. Uh, since then, and I understand that um, you just need to think through it over and over and over again until you find the the right pattern, the right structure, the right process. And um, yeah, I. I I would love to do more of these kind of projects, uh, for sure. I really liked it. Yeah, cool. Let's do that, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to that as well. So, I don't know if you realize that we already landed. Uh, we are at our final destination. So, uh, how would you describe your flight experience uh, of this episode with just three words? Lovely, insightful, and floating. Perfect. Great. So, Ole, thank you so much for being at the New Process Podcast and uh, looking forward to collaborating with you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Let's recap today's New Process Inspiration. Yeah, what a flight. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Ole as much as I did. And, uh, yeah, let's uh, sum it up, what we just heard. Uh, so, it was all about pitching good ideas to different target groups i would say and um i asked him for in the beginning for the secret ingredients of a perfect pitch and he told us that this is um, having a good product vision so what is the product all about to be able to explain the big picture why is it important why now who is the user What is the user experience? And then visualize this. He came up with the Lilium example, um, which I think is very great. If you haven't seen that, uh, have a look into the show notes to look it up. Um, yeah, and then create a story, a narrative out of this product vision to yeah, build your perfect pitch on this. So that's super interesting. And then he told us about the process of how to build how to generate a perfect pitch presentation and um, there it's basically a cycle you are going through so first go into brainstorming open up in a divergent phase and create as many ideas as possible and then boil it down in a convergent phase and uh, reduce it and uh, do rapid prototyping like uh, with regards to a presentation there um, put the the different slides you would uh, like to put into the presentation as a storyboard by using sticky notes onto a wall yeah so to have a first idea and then let it go so go to bed take a nap or do something completely different to let uh, the ideas work in the back of your mind while you're doing something else and uh, then add all these ideas in another phase of brainstorming to the storyboard that you already have on the wall so improve the storyboard the story you would like to tell and then again boil it down so it's more or less a cycle a process that's so great and uh, this can be used not only to pitch uh, business ideas or process to uh, different stakeholders uh, can be used for all the presentations that you are doing in your professional life. So that was super interesting for me to understand that this is a real process behind doing it like that. Yeah, then we talked about how to pitch processes to top management because this is often a big question how can we convince our top management or uh, just uh, higher level managers in the organization um, to use or to apply process management because for sure I believe that it definitely makes sense and there is no alternative to uh, managing your processes in a professional way but now the question is 
um, how can we put that into a pitch presentation? And there he told us to, uh, yeah, design the story from the perspective of the listener to get into the heads of your top management to understand how they are thinking and um, use their frameworks and their mindsets. Take that into account and then put everything into an action-oriented version of your content. So should be concise, visual, simplified um, to get the value out of it right away and uh, to tell the top management what's in it for them so that they can, based on this, then uh, quickly make a decision. So that was his recommendation on how to um, pitch processes or business process management to top management. Yeah, and then we really deep dived into this case, the pizza game, um, to answer or to give an example, I would say, on how to inspire people for processes. And there, I don't want to go into all the details again. I just want to point out that um, making processes and their value experienceable, that's the most important aspect I take out of this story uh, from the interview. So make it physically experienceable for the people how they can apply processes and what the benefit for them is so like we did it with the pizza game in the example here um, we we made it to inspire the people and um, to create ambassadors for process management uh, and then they they took that idea into their organization and they told the colleagues about it and so that that was there the core and he also added Not just only make it physically experienceable, but also add theoretical input there. So to combine both emotions based on practical experience on the one hand side, as well as theoretical input or theoretical experiences on the other side to make it repeatable. So that's the idea to yeah inspire people for processes. And um, If you would like to learn more about this game, feel free to contact Ole or myself. And it uh, would be great if you are interested in that to push it to the next level and to go even further, as Ole said, with digital tools we could take into account and so on. So that would be super interesting. And then we can share the results here again later on. Yeah, and then finally, I, I just I really can recommend his book that he wrote there. And um, it's it, really, it's true. It's lying here next to my desk uh, already for about two years, I think. Uh, that's when it came out. And uh, I'll look into it from time to time just to, to get new inspirations on how to yeah, create a perfect presentation. So... Yeah, I'll put all the links, um, also the ones that Ole mentioned in the interview, into the show notes. So have a look there. And um, yeah, good luck, have fun, enjoy to pitch your process to the people out there to bring it to the next level. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Bye bye and auf Wiedersehen. You've been listening to the New Process Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode for more tools, methods, and best practices to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Next level. Thank you for listening. And before you leave, it would be so great if you quickly think about who of your friends or colleagues would be interested in the New Process Podcast and then send them a message and direct them to newprocesslab.com slash podcast. I think that's the easiest way. So thank you very much and bye-bye.